All right. So again, my name is Jennifer Parker and I work for the town of Collingwood uh, as the coordinator of, coordinator of community well-being and inclusion. And I just wanted to welcome, welcome you today. Uh, and we're really excited to have a Dr. DeVril with us as well as Marcia Alderson from the Unity Collective. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping tips. Uh, so we would like to invite you to ask questions. Um, and to do this, you can use a couple of different functions. We have a Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen where you can uh, click on the icon that says Q&A and then type in a question. And we'll look throughout the discussion and then towards the end as well to answer any questions you may have. At the end of the presentation, uh, we would also welcome you to speak to um, our uh, special guest and you can do that by raising your hand and that will indicate to us that you have a question and then we can unmute your microphone if you would like. Um, and then you will also notice that we have our chat function on the side so you can click on chat and add a comment or a question or speak to uh, the panelists that way as well. So welcome. I'd like to introduce Marcia Alderson from the Unity Collective to move forward with our event. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this very important hour. So on behalf of the Unity Collective, I would like to introduce Dr. Rita Shelton Deverell, who will tell us about telling our stories and it's a, a catalyst for social change. Um, a very important hour coming up. This was not just another Black History Month in North America. As of a year ago, the conversation has changed. The Unity Collective was formed um, in Collingwood by a group of dedicated citizens, neighbors, advocates, and supporters who are committed to taking action to promote unity in our town. The collective was formed after global and regional events, the tragic murder of George Floyd and the ensuing global Black Lives Matter marches and movements that took off across the world, but especially for me in Collingwood. It was an incredible time of people in our town standing up for what is right and what is just. And they made their voices heard loud and clear that they wanted change. So we felt compelled to confront issues in our community and take positive collective action. Our purpose is to build an inclusive Collingwood that welcomes and celebrates our diversity through unified and collective collaboration and action. Mark my words, people, our town is changing. And it's the right. So as a collective, our values are a demonstrated foundation of trust, actions that are globally inspired, but Collingwood focused. The need to respect and promote our shared history and stories this fits, and to be continually inspired by action and bold ideas, and to bridge across all groups in our community. Everyone deserves a seat at the table, and the Unity Collective gives the citizens of this town a voice. So, I am absolutely thrilled to introduce you to Telling Our Stories. Uh, the Unity Collective is promoting these, uh, this series. And our special guest today is Dr. Rita Shelton Deverell. Rita is a theater artist, television producer, director, a scholar, a founder of Vision TV. She was the first woman to lead a journalism program at a Canadian university and concluded her term as news director at Aboriginal People's TV Network in 2005. Rita's awards include two Geminis, the Black Women's Civic Engagement Leadership Award, and the Order of Canada. 
Dr. Devereaux will speak to the importance of storytelling and the role in which our stories can fuel social change. This ties into exactly what the Unity Collective is about. We want to make Collingwood a place that everyone feels welcome and everyone has a sense of belonging. Belonging. We want to embrace the new cultures that are coming here, enjoy everything, the richness, the food and the music, just say. So without further ado, please welcome, it is such an honor, Dr. Rita Shelton Devereaux. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful, I think my internet connection just got fuzzy, but it got unfuzzy again. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you so much for what you are doing. Before I say anything else, I am not on the same land that you are on in Collingwood. I am relatively near Aurelia, which is on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg. The Anishinaabeg includes the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. And I was in Collingwood almost precisely a year ago invited by the wonderful uh, Sylvia and Carolyn Wilson to speak to a group at the uh, Heritage Community Church. So in fact, we can look at that slide. So there are books, which I was of course very happy to do. And it was precisely a year ago, and I remember this vividly because it was right before the lockdown. Coming to Collingwood was the last thing I did when I was sort of free to go places and do things and meet people. Um, so I'm very glad to be back a, a year later, but not in person through the uh, miracle of Zoom. Uh, we, we take what we can get. I'm gonna make you uh, do a little work. If you can have some uh, pen and paper by your side, and these notes are for you, I won't make you read them unless you choose to, but um, you, you uh, may want to refer to your insights later as the uh, months proceed and you move forward with your Unity Collective. The other reason though I remember being in Collingwood a year ago was because of something that happened the night before, which has a great deal to do with telling our stories. I said to uh, the wonderful Sylvia and Carolyn, I think I'd better come the night before so that I'm sure that I'm there for the speech. And so they made me a, a, a reservation in a hotel. And when I checked into the hotel, plugged in my computer, like it is now, um, there was an, a Facebook request on my computer from a woman I had not had any exchanges with for a, at least 25 years. And so it was a friend request. And I was about to respond when I thought I'd better Google her and see what's happened in her life and realized that her husband had died. So I thought, okay, before I put on the friend 
request what I was about to say, I'd best write to her and express my condolences for uh, the death of her husband. So I did that. And then I got a note back saying, uh, thank you for your uh, condolences. I wondered if you would still be speaking to me and I um, am, am, am grateful that you are. The reason she wondered if I would still be speaking to her. So I knew this woman when I was head of production at Vision TV. She was multicultural, multi of all kinds she was doing she was doing a very good job she was doing a very good job of the commentary young woman a uh, young parent and I decided um, to record one of her commentaries in her home office I had never been to her home before and I walk into her office this is more than 25 five years ago, I walk into her office and there is a Confederate flag on the wall. I just about fell backwards and hit my head and I expressed my concern about this flag. And she informed me that it was just a matter of decor, that she was in her sort of Scarlet O'Hara gone with the wind uh, mode and this was an item of decor for her now at this point i have to get my show made uh do, doing daily and weekly shows is an incredible discipline and grind so i thought okay i can't talk about this forever i will get the shot without Uh, slowly let this my roster of people I am hiring and that's what happened it was very disturbing it was in part disturbing because she was Jewish and I <laughs> I was thinking how would she feel if she walked into my office and there was a swastika on the wall um, not very cheery I'm thinking, but also I was amazed that as a black person from the U.S. South, Confederate flags were a very serious matter to me. That she was apologizing 25 years later was a wonderful step for me. And it's the night before I was making a presentation in calling so i remember it vividly to call to your attention one is we have different stories and we need to listen to the variety in our stories before we say they're all the same story because they're not they're different stories, and it takes uh, a certain appreciation, a certain humility to listen to stories that are not your own and know why that's an important story. The other thing is she was wonderful enough to not let this go. 25 years later, she was saying, I now know why this was so offensive. I'm sorry. That, that was wonderful to me. And um, I've been happy about it ever since. So with your little pad that you've got beside your camera, um, note down
one thing about your culture and background you think people need to know to know who you are it could be something quite small that it seems very insignificant but what in your culture or background is something that people need to know to understand you um i'm going to move along <laughs> and tell you uh, another story so uh Tyler, can we have the convocation? So, 2017, I was very uh, honored to get an honorary doctorate from, uh, I think there it is. Yes, so there's me in all of my regalia. I think, you know, every time a picture comes up, the internet doesn't like it. Uh, so there is me in all my regalia. I got an honor. One of the things, you, you're supposed to make the convocation speech. So one of the things that I told the graduates is that a few years back, I was in church and the uh, organist played the War March of the Priest by Mendelssohn for the postlude, and I hadn't thought about this piece of music in, oh, years, probably almost 40 or more. And it suddenly brought back to me the convocations I had gone to as a young child in Houston, Texas, which is where I am from, at the Black University in Houston, which was walking distance of my home. This is Texas Southern University. So it was founded when the schools were very much segregated. And as I say, it was in walking distance of my home. The young lady who is taller than I am, who is standing next to me, is my grand niece who lives in Toronto. And I wanted her to be at the convocation because I wanted her to understand that the only destination for her when she graduated from high school was post-secondary education, that this is where she was destined. Okay, so, to cut back to the convocation. Speech and the war march of the prince. If I didn't know anybody who was graduating, why were my parents taking me by the hand when I'm seven years old, eight, nine, ten, to a convocation? It was because they wanted me to understand that this was the only acceptable destination for me. I was supposed to be in some of those convocations. And this brings George Floyd, whom Marcia mentioned earlier. Uh, and I'm sure we're all very aware of George Floyd. I grew up in the very same black ghetto, third ward of Houston, Texas, as George Floyd. We went to the same high school. The only thing is, he went to our high school. Uh, I went 40 years earlier. Uh, I'm old enough to be his mother. And in fact, my son is uh, George Floyd's age. So this was an incident that was um, very shattering to me, not shattering in the sense that I was uh, crying, shattered in the sense that I was reaffirmed to everything that's important. And now we come back to the convocation, though. 
I say we lived in the same neighborhood, the same ghetto, we went to the same high school. However, I had immense privilege compared to George Floyd. And this may account for, I don't know if you picked up this news item, but Texas Southern University, the same one that I'm talking about, which was across the street from public housing where George Floyd lived, he could not manage to cross that street and be in those convocations. He had, his life chances were very different. I'm one child, had uh, five siblings, I think. He had five siblings and one parent. He was in public housing. I was in a relatively large detached house. My two parents worked at jobs that were relatively well paying for their entire lives and were able to finance that education at university through a master's degree for me. Very different life chances, very different privileges. And I had been programmed from eight years old to this is where you have to be. You have to be in these lineups and that's why my niece my grand niece was at lakehead university in 2017. so now take that pad that's next to your chair and um make a quick list of the ways you are advantaged, the way you have advantages, advantages, if both. I was just telling you about the nature of my privilege. Uh, major that my parents were sending me into that convocation procession. And you see, it worked. There I am. Um, it worked. I was trying to make it work for my grand niece. Um, and it has worked. She's just been accepted um, in post-secondary education within the last week. I'm very proud of her. So think about your advantages and your disadvantages. One of the things they like to say, oh, I, I'm not privileged. I, I, I don't have any advantages. That's not what you're supposed to do with privilege. You're not supposed to deny it. You're supposed to use it for something. You're supposed to use it to make the world a better place. That's what advantages are for. So you only need to apologize if you're not using advantages and privileges to make the world a better place. Okay, we're gonna move along a bit in time. Um, in fact, uh, way along. Uh, I wrote in um, 2019 a play called Who You Calling Black, A. Eh? Uh, so Tyler, we can, we can look at that uh, slide. Who You Calling Black, A eh? came to me. Now, I'm very proud of the fact that this play got the Teen Jury Award at the Toronto Fringe the 
am 75 years old that a group of teenagers thought this play spoke to them meant the world to me, absolutely the world. Um, and the cast, of course, was younger than I was, and they were just over the moon. Uh, they, the, the cast was six people, which is a relatively large cast for a fringe play. So we were over the moon that teenagers thought we had, we had stories to tell them. But the play came for me I was in Halifax for three, three and a half years. And I was these young women, mixed race women, as we say these days, who were confused about racial identity in some cases to the point of being and I understand this. I'm black. I've always been black. I didn't consider that a great mystery. Not to mention that I grew up in the U.S. South uh, when things were very segregated prior to the Civil Rights Movement. So I've never had any confusion about saying I'm black. However, these young women were identity-wise confused. So I was so bothered by this, I consulted with a black colleague at another university, and I'm saying, what is all this about? What, what, what is their problem? What is going on here? And she said, this is not a problem for you. It's not a problem for me. We're old. We're black. We know who we are. She said, but this really is a problem for these young women. And why don't you write something? And hence, I wrote a play, Who Are You Calling Black A?, that did seem to say something to young people and hence got the Teen Jury Award. But the reason I mention this today is this is listening to stories that are not your story. I had to calm down and hear what these young women were saying. That's what we all have to do when we t tell our stories to other people. We don't challenge that that's their story. Their story is their story. If I can't explain to you why a Confederate flag bothers me, you have to accept that it bothers me. And I have to accept whatever you've told me. And this keeps happening and we are really sitting with each other's stories because we don't all have the same stories, but we can develop the same appreciation. Um, the TV Guide, the Tyler. This TV Guide is uh, probably about 25 years old, too. And uh, it, it's when I was uh, being the anchor of uh, Vision TV, and there was lots of publicity about this, and that was all wonderful. Uh, in those years, it solved all of the problems of nation and racism in media industries. And and the reason I was convinced of this is because, of course, I was heir and I hired lots of people who looked like me to be on the air. What I didn't know then that I have come to know is that what's really important is that a diversity of people 
be at every level of an organization, every single level, including executive management and boards of directors. And that's why I spend so much of my time now being on boards of directors because somebody has to do it. And actually, it's much easier to do in your golden years because you have the time and you have the time that you don't have to be compensated for. So you can send all those people to university. Uh, but it's easier in your golden years. Um, what's important about organizations? And you are in an organization in a city. Is that you recognize that diversity at every level of the organization. The citizen level, the political level, all levels are recognized. And uh, you know this, you know, diversity at every level of our society. And I'm only going to tell you one more thing, um, and that's about the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Council, Committee at Lakehead University. The president at Lakehead decided every staff per and member at Lakehead, Thunder Bay, and Aurelia to have some indigenous literacy training. Uh, some people thought they didn't need this. Others immediately saw why they did need this. And so I volunteered to be on her council. And then COVID came along and all of the sessions that we were going to have in person, we suddenly had to figure out how to ha do this online like we are doing now. And we are uh, going through the process of eight chapters that all involve stories of um, histories and futures and presence of indigenous peoples and what that also has to do with all the rest of us, uh, all the rest of us where those stories intersect with our stories, what we're doing right now the president of Lakehead going and planning, and it's not perfect, but an action is what always needs to happen as a result of anti-racism initiatives. It's, it's not something that you only think about, it's something that you do. What you can do varies with every person. Um, Sylvia and Carolyn and their wonderful museum, what an action that is. What an action that they have taken on their own with lots of help from their friends and supporters. So always when you uh, are thinking of the stories of the community, when you're thinking of your own pledge to anti-racism activities, to diversity, equity, and inclusion, what are the actions that go with that? Sometimes the action is as seemingly simple as sitting with someone else's story and trying to understand why that is an important story for them. And then they sit with you and listen to your story. Our stories are actually all different. 
We don't know what they are just by looking at people any more than you know by looking at me that I grew up in the same black ghetto of Houston, Texas as George Floyd. You can't know that until I tell you or you find it out from someplace else. So think of the actions that you are undertaking in the next few months uh, between now and maybe the next Black History Month, uh, between now and the next International Women's Day, between now and when we are able to have more freedom of movement. Um, it's, it's an action. Listening to stories is an action. Well, I have been talking a lot, and I think that I should stop talking quite so much and uh, have a few questions and answers. And if anyone wants to share their advantages and disadvantages are uh, a significant thing about their background, I am happy, I'm sure we all will be happy to hear this. So if you uh, have a question or a comment, as uh, Jennifer said, there are several ways verbally by uh, having your content. Uh, you can use the Q&A feature, the chat function, raise your hand. So uh, Jennifer, how are we doing with that? Well, we have a question from Bam. So I'm just going to unmute Bam or invite um, Bam to speak and ask his question or make his comment. Bam, uh, you could go ahead. Yes, can everybody hear me? Yes. Ms. Dara, I just wanted to thank you um, so very, very much um, for what you've done. It is, again, remarkable that you fit so much in your day to have gotten us this far. I appreciate everything that you've done. I, like you, have a story from the other side of the, the water. I grew up as a Canadian. My mom um, dated an American. that caused us to go from Sarnia to Detroit. What I didn't know at the time was that I was, had an opportunity to work with the late Honorable John Conyers Jr. I was 14 years old at the time. And part of my job aside from doing anything he asked me to do, was to walk Miss Rosa Parks to the bus stop after work. She volunteered in that office and she did everything from stuffing envelopes to just being there. She was like our, all of our grandmother. And at the end of the day, I had the privilege of being able to escort her to the bus stop. And I remember my conversations with Ms. Parks and how I told her that we were going to eradicate that ugly stench that was in the air back then because I was on the forefront of the civil rights movement back then. I'm old now. <laughs> I got involved at 14 thinking that I could help stop it so that we wouldn't be here now, but we are. And you've been through that same walk and you've seen those same things and you've given us a voice. And when I heard that you were going to speak today, I was more than excited. You are our, one of our elders and it is with those teachings that we all get to learn and we get to grow. 
It is certainly with our stories that we share. So I'm greatly appreciative and I don't know why I went off on that tangent other than just looking at you and being inspired by you and wanting to connect to my people again. And you are definitely the closest to that, Carolyn and, and the Sheffields and everyone here in Collingwood that has made that possible for me to connect. I miss that connection. So I appreciate you and I thank you for your time today. I thank you for everything that you've done on the forefront of just bringing awareness to a people, a great people that have a contribution, that have made contributions. And I'm hopeful, even in the midst of what we've been through, still remain hopeful at the things that we can do to continue to bring focus to black and brown people and the contributions we make, not the things we take, but the contributions we make and the stories we have to share. Thank you, Ms. Deborah. I appreciate you. Oh, well, thank you. That's not a tangent at all. Uh, I will make a little uh, sidebar to your comment about still doing this. Um, this year, I've been involved with a group of older women professional actors. Acting was my first profession. And I decided I wanted to get back to it when I was about 60 and stopped being a full-time broadcaster. Um, so they're, they're called Act Three. And we, of course, are very hopeful um, that we will be able to do our play when uh, people can be back in theaters because now theaters are completely shut down. In any case, uh, we're supposed to write scenes. They, they had two prompts. Uh, one is your scene had to take place on a carousel, a merry-go-round. And the second thing was it had to have a character named Mary. So I wrote my scene and exactly what it's about is how you have to keep going round and round and staying on that carousel until you're old because something else always needs to be done and you need to do it with hope. Um, so I was in fact grateful, uh, I call them the old lady actors, which is uh, act three is a much nicer <laughs> title for the group. And it's a wonderful group. A actually we're meeting tonight. Uh, so we read each other's scenes uh, uh, via Zoom. And we're looking forward to the day when our play will be on somebody's uh, stage. But yes, um, you don't retire from making the world a better place. And thank you for, for uh, sharing that story. A uh, book, which I was talking about a year ago, is called um, American Refugees Turning to Canada for Freedom. And uh, the wonderful Sylvia and Carolyn, when you can get back to their museum, uh, will have the book in their bookstore. And I'm so grateful to them for stocking the book. Yes, there it is. Uh, And so there are stories of the Revolutionary War to Donald Trump. Um, and among them are uh, Carolyn and, and, and Sylvia. So their story is in the book. And uh, I hope uh, people who haven't read it 
get a chance to get a copy. Well, I think we've got some more in the Q&A. Yes, we do. So we have a question. Have you seen improvements in awareness and inclusion since your time growing up in Texas? Is there an action that stands out as supporting one or more of these improvements? And the, uh, the attendees asking because they want to learn from these uh, improvements and experiences and expand upon them and accelerate improvements, uh, I'm assuming in a, a more local context. The main thing that I, I will actually mention is what's been happening in the last year. Um, I wasn't going to comment on the George Floyd matter, that is in media, until I realized that we had gone to the same high school and lived in the same ghetto. Uh, so one of my uh, old high school chums called this to my attention. I didn't know that uh, George Floyd had gone to Jack Yates Senior High School until my um, chum called this to my attention. So what I said when I wrote my first letter to Aurelia Matters is that when I commented on the protest and the great uh, distress after Martin Luther King was assassinated and uh, Kennedy was assassinated, I was criticized in the press. So this is in the 1960s. I'm criticized for not realizing that I had come to Canada uh, which I should be grateful for, where there was no racism. That was the reaction to my commenting on those events. I'm being a little bit glib, but I really did put this in the letter. And so a major difference, and you would expect differences 50 years later, is that Almost no one was agreeing that there was racism in Canada, that something had to be done, and that something had to be done quickly. Um, so that is an improvement. Knowing what the problem is, coming to the recognition that there is a problem is more than halfway there to finding solutions to the problem. And one of our, uh, we Canadians are lovely people. We're extraordinary people for all kinds of reasons. So I won't keep complimenting us. But one of our biggest problems is we really don't like to look at our colonial history. We really don't like to uh, admit that the Underground Railroad didn't solve every problem for Black people for all time. Um, we really don't like to admit that there was slavery in Canada. But as soon as we can admit those things, we're more than halfway there to making an improvement. So uh, that was a long way around to saying, I think that every time we come to a clear admission of what our problems are, we've made many steps forward. And that that's an important thing to do as individuals, as groups, as a city government, uh, uh, I, I had the um, uh, great pleasure of going to South Africa about five years ago. I had never been to Africa before, and I was on a film and television tour to South Africa. And we, um, because they have a very big industry. So we were in a number of, at a number of sound stages and, and uh, studios, 
And I discovered that in South Africa, they have what they call historically disadvantaged individuals. And employers are given a premium, more money, if they employ historically disadvantaged individuals. And I quipped to my Canadian colleagues that if we ever got to the point where we could admit there were such people, just admit there are such people. There are people who are historically disadvantaged. And we're going to do something to improve their situation. Better shape. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that is one, a clear recognition of uh, our problems and a clear recognition of our advantages, which we have to use to make the world a better place, is a technique. So, Jennifer, you've got more there, I think. Yes, thank you. So another question from an attendee, and again, a reflection um, on what an honor it is to have you as an elder and the conversations that you bring uh, to our community today. Uh, the question was uh, that you had given us some homework um, around reflecting on ourselves. Could you share why this is important? So uh, looking at our privileges, uh, why it is so important to reflect on our own uh, personal privileges and assumptions? Actually, I, oh, why am I? I use that exercise whenever I teach university students. And I'll, I'll give you a, a bit of background. Um, the Toronto School Board and other school boards have tried to use the white privilege exercise where white people become aware of their privileges and uh, note them down. And I think that's as far as it goes. Um, most people hate this exercise. <laughs> they absolutely hate it. And there's always rebellion when it's uh, tried to be used. So I was teaching diversity journalism at uh, Ryerson. And this exercise was supposed to be part of the course. and I uh, did the exercise and I thought okay maybe I can make this more acceptable and that was when I changed the language to having everybody talk about their advantages and disadvantages as to what it's useful for it is precisely to um, be clear-eyed about your advantages. So is, before you say you don't have any advantages, the first one is you're here. You're sitting here in this university. That's an advantage right there. Uh, it's an advantage everybody doesn't have. It's an advantage. A trap also is if we are in an underrepresented group or one of the four designated groups to think we don't have any advantages, we don't have any privileges. Well, it's a terrible thing when you don't recognize your own privilege because if you don't recognize your own privilege you can't use it for good not recognizing it is to uh, probably do some harm um, so when we know what advantages we have, which translates into what power do we have? 
rather than denying the power, denying the privilege, denying the advantages, the question is, how are we going to use that to make the world a better place? This is also true, though, for just plain us as individuals. How am I going to turn my disadvantages, whatever they may be, into advantages so that I am increasing my own empowerment, my own ability to make things better? Um, and when I'm teaching, as I say, I always use the example of it's crazy for me to say, because I'm black and because I'm a woman and because I'm old, I don't have any advantages. Um, I have tons, including in that circumstance. I'm the teacher. I'm giving out the grades. I've got power. So what am I going to use that for? And That's the question we always have to be asked for good, whoever we are. And I think I see one more. Is that think, right? Yeah, I think that was our final question. I just open it up to everyone um, in the room. If you do have a question, please let us know by typing something into our Q&A or raising your hand if you'd like to speak. Um, and conscious also of our time as well. So I'll open that out. I just wanted to reiterate the thoughts uh, that have been shared already and um, extend my appreciation to you, Rita, for your time and, and the stories. I have had much to reflect upon uh, over the last hour. It has been a tremendous privilege and honor to to have you with us today. Um, and, uh, and I will take away many thoughts in, in, uh, as I, I reflect post-webinar. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much. For uh, the work you've obviously all been doing success in your uh, collective and uh, with the, the promises that you've made to yourselves to make uh, some changes, some improvements, to move forward in, in your community. And it is your community. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. And to the audience and attendees, uh, we will place a recording up on Rally Point. So please share and let others know. Um, and if you do have any questions or would like to make any further contact, you're more than welcome to connect through uh, to myself and I can connect you on to our presenter as well. Um, and uh, I wish you all the best for a, a wonderful afternoon and, and hope that you've had a great experience today.